Okay, well, I think we can get started and then as people kind of come in, they can uh, figure out that we're halfway in progress. So welcome everybody. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for coming to this event. Um, this is the first of our uh, program this year. I think this one's going to be uh, a really exciting one. Um, yeah, this one uh, is a joint joint uh, presentation by um, Sean Rathwell from Dylan Consulting and, and Alex Stechiafontis from OC Transpo on the uh, Bus Alternative Energy Systems project that they uh, they undertook. Um, so welcome, yeah, welcome. And uh, I just want to start by thanking our sponsors uh, for uh, for this past year of our programming: uh, Parsons, Dillon, Morrison, Hirschfield, JL Richards, BT Engineering, CGH, WSP, and Stantec. Thank you very much for supporting uh, the National Capital Section. Um, we look forward to putting on a lot more events uh, coming shortly. Um, I know we're looking at having one um, next month that uh, should be another corker. And we will be um, also uh, announcing the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award shortly. So stay tuned. We have lots of exciting stuff coming up. Um, so yeah, so today uh, we have, uh, I guess I, I should probably start just by sort of saying, as um as the presentation goes forward you all should have the option to chat there's probably a little speech bubble there um feel free to enter your questions just as you think of them as the the uh, presentation is going on i will at the end of the presentation uh read out all of the the stored questions and then we can also kind of open the floor for live questions if anyone has any at that time too um so uh yeah just whenever you think of them just shove them in there and then we'll we'll get to them at the end so um yeah i guess uh i will introduce our speakers um alex stechiafontis is a transportation planner with over 10 years of experience in the public transit and aviation industries prior to joining osu transpo in 2016 he was the manager of airport planning and municipal affairs at the ottawa international airport authority um, his professional experience ranges from the implementation of rail transit service to the airport uh, to planning long-term development of OC Transpo bus network and managing planning projects for the City of Ottawa's transition to a zero emissions bus fleet, which we may hear uh, something about. Um, Alex has also worked on the design and planning of many transportation infrastructure projects, including bus rapid transit corridors, new transit stations, airport facilities, and transportation transit priority measures. Sean Rathwell is a transit and urban mobility specialist with Dillon. Uh, he has more than 36 years of experience in the Canadian transit industry. He started his career at OC Transpo and spent 15 years working on the planning and operation of transit services throughout the Ottawa region. As the manager of service planning, Sean was responsible for route planning, schedule analysis, service strategies, detour and development planning, and the operational planning and development of transit infrastructure such as terminals and stations, bus rapid transit facilities, transit priority measures, uh, and park and ride facilities. Uh, in 2000, Sean joined a leading uh, Canadian transportation consulting firm and since then has worked on a wide variety of transit strategy, policy, planning, and infrastructure projects throughout Canada, the United States, Australia, and a number of other countries. He has been with Dillon since 2015. I think there's a lot of a uh, lot of experience in this uh, in this presentation, and uh, I'm very excited, and I hope you all are too. I will now hand over the the floor to I believe Sean will be beginning the presentation. So, Sean, if you will, thank you. Unmute myself, and I'll be ready to go there. Actually, Alex is going to start off things. Uh, do the first uh, four or five slides to introduce the, the effort and uh, and set the stage. Um, I'll do some things in the middle about the work that Dylan actually did, and then uh, Alex will talk more about the city stuff. So, Alex. All right. Thank you for the great introduction, Sean, and thank you, for Sean, for uh, driving these slides. If you can go to the uh, outline slide on the next page. So, today, uh, Sean and I are going to discuss the uh, electric bus project essentially all the way from the outset at the uh, climate emergency the city declared all the way to our current pilot project, our uh, procurement that's just getting underway and the next steps. Uh, and then including a lot of work that Sean did on the selection of technologies in the bus alternative energy systems project. Uh, next slide please, Sean. 
So to begin kind of where, where this all starts, uh, in 2019, the city declared a climate emergency. Um, this actually led to the city undertaking what was called the Climate Change Master Plan and the Energy Evolutions Report. Um, so what that did is it set the goal of the corporation of the city of Ottawa becoming uh, zero greenhouse gas emitting or net zero by 2040 with a goal of the entire city of Ottawa becoming net zero by 2050. So the, the city of Ottawa itself is aiming to achieve that goal 10 years uh, ahead of the whole city of Ottawa. Um, as part of achieving that goal, the um, city of Ottawa modeled almost all the corporate uh, emission aspects, including transit. So what's uh, shown below on the slide at the bottom is an excerpt from the energy evolution model and greenhouse uh, gas emission study. Um, what the study found that was in order to achieve the 100% emissions, transit would need to be zero emissions, either through uh, electric or fuel cell or uh, clean uh, greenhouse emitting fuels such as natural gas. Uh, but that kind of left it open into how we would achieve it. Uh, so next slide, Sean. So in 2020, following the approval of the Climate Change Master Plan, um, we then started looking into how OC Transpo is going to uh, get to that zero emission target by 2040. Uh, it turns out, or it, it turns out that in order to get to that 2040, transit would need to be electrified by 2030. So we really needed to get going and started looking at. Um, all sorts of different zero emission technologies. And the best way to do that was to study all the possible different options to get there and what are the interim steps. So uh, what we discussed was a five-year plan because the technology was changing so rapidly in many of the different uh, available fuel types, including fuel cell, uh, including battery electric, that we were looking at a report to council that went in June last year um, and I don't want to spoil too much more of the presentation, but uh, Sean's going to get into that, where we would recommend a five-year plan of a specific technology that uh, you'll hear more about. And I'll follow up uh, after Sean's presentation. So thanks, Alex. Um, what Alex and the team at Oso Transport decided to do was engage Dylan to help uh, the city develop what we call the Bus Alternative Energy Systems Project, or the BASE Project. And it's consisted of three um, distinct pieces of work over the last uh, over year and a half or so. Uh, selection of preferred technologies, implementation plan, and some additional work on, on what we call high capacity buses articulated and uh, double deckers. So we'll just wade through each of, of these components and, and give you the highlights of them. First of all, the selection of technologies. Um, as Alex said, lots of, um, a full range of technologies was assessed. Um, this included uh, compressed natural gas, CNG, um, and something called renewable natural gas, which is still natural gas, but it's created uh, from the processing of waste or industrial processes or something like that, meaning it has come out of the ground, essentially. And, um, and then the diesel electric hybrids, similar to the one on the right in the screen here that OC Transco ran for a number of years. Uh, they don't operate any of them anymore. but. Uh, all three of these technologies are, um, are, are being used by transit agencies in Canada uh, today and do have lower emissions than the general diesel approach. We also looked at the trolleybus. Um, the only place in Canada where these operate today are, are in Vancouver, which is what you're seeing here. They're, they are in a few other places in the US, Seattle and San Francisco particularly. Um, and they're a fully electric bus, um, whether it's articulated or a standard length of bus. Uh, and they get their power and electricity from those, uh, those arms that reach up to a catenary system that's over the street. Uh, so very much like a light rail approach. Um, and uh, these buses have to be on the, uh, on the catenary. Uh, the ones in Vancouver have no capability to operate off, off of the wire at all. Some of the newer ones might, but, uh, but they don't today. Um, we also looked at hydrogen fuel cell electric. Um, you've heard, many of you would have heard of Ballard Power, the, um, the sort of Canadian example, the prime Canadian example of, of, uh, of, of fuel cells. 
Um, and uh, in this case, you know, hydrogen is fed into a fuel cell and the byproducts are electricity to power the motors that drive the wheels and the systems on the bus. And uh, water is the only kind of emission that you, you really get. Um, we looked finally at battery electric technologies. And that's a plural uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, well, they all have, you know, a battery pack of some sort in them. Uh, there's sort of two charging approaches, as you see on the top right, charging in the garage, whether it's from a ground mounted thing that you would see in your house or at a store or something for your car um, or um, overhead, like the pantograph that's shown in the image. And you can also do charging on the street, if you will. Um, and the difference between in the garage charging versus on the street is in the garage charging buses tend to have a larger battery capacity thus greater range because they only going out and coming back. Um, whereas with smaller battery capacity, we then do multiple charges along the way. So we looked at, at those technologies together. Being good transportation planners, um, we uh, set up a, a grid to do an evaluation and uh, four primary categories for evaluation, the vehicle, the infrastructure needs, the operational impacts and the environmental impacts. And within each of those um, primary categories, number of subcategories, the percentages you see there are the sort of weighting factors that were developed um, with um, a group effort with a technical steering committee that the city put together to assist with this project and, and how they, um, and, and what they felt was important, uh, each individual sort of averaged together. The results of the technology selection were probably not too surprising to most of you, but uh, CNG, RNG, hybrid electric, while they are lower emission than the conventional diesels, um, they're not zero emission. And as such, they don't really meet the city's climate change plan requirements. They're not eligible for any funding right now um, from senior levels of government towards um, uh, zero emission buses. So um, off the table, essentially. Um, trolley buses, um, well, they're attractive in a lot of ways. They are the absolutely most expensive vehicle to buy of any of them. They are the most expensive technology to maintain those vehicles. Um, that's because there aren't too many of them around. The parts are expensive, long lead times and so on. And uh, they require a lot, all that substantial additional infrastructure. You've got to build the catenary system and the rectifying power stations all along the route. Um, in order to make it happen, and you can't really go anywhere else uh, uh, with, with much reliability. Hydrogen fuel cell electric buses are certainly feasible, um, are practical, they are out there, although in smaller numbers than battery electric, but they are a bit more expensive to buy as a vehicle. Um, and the biggest issue really for Ottawa was there is no hydrogen in Ottawa. Um, you get hydrogen by either, you know, processes that created, industrial processes, for example, and the closest one in Ontario that produces that is in Sarnia, as we've learned. Uh, there are some in Quebec, but the main thing is if you want to get hydrogen that's already there, you have to truck it in from somewhere, which seems kind of counterintuitive to, uh, to things. Um, or you can create your own hydrogen using an electrolysis process, build a big electrolyzing machine. And as we learned, it, it works fine, but um, the amount of electricity uh, needed to get a similar range of battery electric is more because of the losses in the electrolysis process, the power losses uh, that you have. So it's going to be a more expensive process. Battery electric buses are the most, are the least expensive uh, of the zero emission vehicles, and uh, they're they're very available. They've been on the market the longest compared to, or uh, in higher numbers too, compared to hydrogen fuel cell electrics. Um, they don't require quite as much infrastructure, certainly as the trolley buses, and it's similar to what you need for, for hydrogen fuel cell in the bigger picture. Um, and there's uh, lots of upside for potential improvements in the battery technology in terms of density of the energy so you can get better range uh, and these sorts of things. So uh, the conclusion, the recommendation, certainly with larger buses, was to proceed with considerations of battery electric technology, um, but definitely uh, keep an eye on how technology is progressing over the coming five years and um, make sure that it is advancing the way you wish, because the city's ultimate goal is to be able to replace 
a diesel bus with a battery electric bus on a one-to-one -one basis, something you can't necessarily do now because the range is much higher on the diesel. And then proceed with an implementation plan to figure out what the costs and, and, and things you have to do to make this happen are. As far as the paratransit buses are concerned, they're also a factor here. When we were doing the work on the selection technologies, there was very little on the market um, that was proven in any way uh, of a small vehicle that would be suitable for a paratransit bus. And with the, um, uh, the fleet replacements scheduled to happen um, sort of in a year or two from when we were doing the work, there didn't seem to be time to feel confident that you could buy a technology that would work and be effective in service. So the, um, the, the recommendation was made to delay implementing the new technology for the next replacement cycle in a couple of years. And then um, uh, these vehicles have a much shorter life, seven years or so compared with 15 for the full size buses. Um, and then, you know, monitor technology, do your pilot tests, uh, feel comfortable and you can um, move forward uh, at, that, at the subsequent replacement cycle around 2030. Uh, Alex will tell you how this, this recommendation has evolved a little bit with, with other aspects, but uh, that let us move on with the implementation plan. Um, lots of elements to this, and um, we had to create sort of individual plans for the vehicle purchase um, and how that would evolve. The garage facilities plan uh, to look at the infrastructure you need in the garages itself to make uh, battery electric feasible. Offsite infrastructure, um, you don't have to just do things in the garage, there's things you have to do before you get to the garage as well. And then a training plan because um, the technology with high voltage, all the mechanics need certain levels of training. The vehicle operating characteristics are a bit different um, and it's been recommended that, um, that operators receive a small amount of training so they're aware of, of what to expect. And then we bring all that together in a, an overall plan for 15 years. And that 15 years comes from the life of the bus, uh, the full cycle needed to put everything into a, um, a uh, battery electric uh, zero emission uh, setup. So to explain a bit more why you've got all these other bits, uh, if you look over on the left of the screen, the grid and substation elements, none of OC transpose garages and frankly, virtually no transit garage across the country has enough electricity coming to it or near it um, to accommodate the charging of battery electric buses. It's megawatts and megawatts of electricity that you need just at each garage in, in Ottawa's case. So that means there needs to be grid upgrades um, in the electrical distribution system, probably substation upgrades. So Hydro Ottawa um, needs to get involved um, and, um, and get things built and set up to get the electricity to the garage sites. Um, once you get on the garage, you've got to be able to receive this high voltage power and transform it down to something that you can manage and distribute within the site itself. Um, you need um, various transformers, uh, upgraded electrical rooms throughout the site to manage all the things that are happening there and probably some backup power as well. And then finally, you know, you've got the, the electricity being distributed around, you've got the on-site electric bus charging equipment, you have charging power packs where the electricity comes in, and then you've got um, the dispensers, either the ground-mounted or wall-mounted plug-in types that you're familiar with, with cars, or the overhead pantographs or outside overhead uh, uh, dispensers as well. And all of that stuff, um, uh, a division of Hydro Ottawa called Anvari, um, assisted the city with um, with getting some of the costs figured out and the implications. Um, they were they were very important in putting that work together. And then finally, on the right side, you've got the vehicles themselves. <laughs> Once you've actually got them uh, in place, you've got to have all this other stuff ready in the first place. So each of the different elements, just to give you an idea of the money involved here, um, the vehicles themselves, mostly transport has those four kinds of vehicles that you see. Um, and um, you see on the left, the approximate um, battery electric bus costs for those different bus types. Uh, 1.3 million for the 40 foot standard transit bus. That compares to almost 800,000 that a diesel version would, would require today. So about a half a million dollar premium. 
Um, and then the articulated buses and double decker buses today are kind of in the, they're about 50% more expensive than a, an articulated bus in diesel. And it's similar in, in the electric uh, approach. And then the paratransit buses at a half a million dollars, that compares to, there's a lot of variety in the, in the paratransit vehicles, low floor, standard floor, uh, different lengths and sizes. So they, they vary quite a bit in cost, but you know, the kind that OC Transpo operates is, is somewhere sort of the two fifty dollars $300,000 range. If they were replacing them right now with a, a diesel type version. So put it all together over 15 years and you're looking at not quite $1.5 billion just to replace the bus fleet. Um, and with a half a million dollar premium, that's not something that uh, OC Transpo and the city is able to afford without senior government um, assistance. And Alex will tell you more about that stuff a little bit later. The 15 year plan, the vehicle purchase plan that, that LC Transco is working with at the moment uh, looks somewhat like this. And as they replace it with this implementation plan with battery electrics, you see the blue diesel buses on the, the screen um, diminishing and the orangish uh, portion of the bar, which is the battery electric component, uh, increasing. And this is what a large bus looks like. If you're wondering about the dip, in 2025, that's um, uh, a reduction in the number of buses as the um, as the phase two of LRT starts to come online, and and uh, you don't have to bring the buses as far into um, uh, to Blair and Tunney's, uh, for example. The garage facilities plan for OC Transpo's four garage sites: the large Saint Laurent complex on uh, Saint Laurent and Belfast, the industrial complex on Industrial um, between uh, Innes and the train yards, uh, Merivale on Colonnade, uh, Merivale site on Colonnade Road, right across from my Dillon office, and um, and the Pinecrest site on Queensview Drive, uh, north of the Queensway opposite IKEA, is where they all are. Um, the garage electrical requirements, so the on-site substation, the distribution, switchboards, and so on, and backup generation, about $175 million to outfit all four of those sites brought together. Um, the charging infrastructure is more expensive than all of that, even about $215 million by the time you've fully outfitted everything with charger packs, overhead pantographs, plug-in dispensers likely for the paratransit vehicles. Um, and then there's a, some additional renovations that are going to be needed in the garage. Um, we've put an allowance in uh, to check on roof structures in the garages to make sure that they can deal with the pantographs uh, being put down um, there. Um, but also some of the service bays are going to need uh, changes to deal with the new equipment um, for maintenance. You're not having the diesel engines, you've got electrical things now. Uh, and and batch electric vehicles are a lot heavier than diesels, so um, hoists need to be upgraded. Um, in all, about $24 million in additional costs uh, just to do that portion. Off-site, the electricity grid and substation upgrade costs um, are, uh, as estimated by Ambari, for these places uh, brought together, about $68 million, a little bit more. Um, we put a line item in for on-street charging infrastructure, but in the fullness of, of the analysis, they decided we decided collectively with OC Transpo to uh, to not uh, put any on-street cost uh, charging things in place. Um, but I'll have more to say about that when we're talking about the high capacity buses in, in a few moments. Also a training plan. The example on the, in the graphic there is one that Winnipeg has put together is they're a little bit farther down the path than, than Ottawa was uh, in getting themselves ready for this. But uh, in essence, you need operator and mechanics uh, training. Um, you need a, to manage that effort and make sure that everybody gets it, a delivery approach, train the trainers, you know, these sorts of things. And putting it all together, the time for everybody to do this, um, bring the, the people offline of their normal duties, Get them trained and so on is about 11 and a half million dollars. It's not a small effort, um, given that there's a good 2,500 ish people that need to be trained um, in at the OC Transpo uh, effort. So, bringing all that together, you know, we talked about the 1.45 billion for vehicles and so on, it comes out to just a little less than two billion dollars, um, which is an enormous sum of money. Um, and about half of that, if you sort of work through year by year, is going to have to be spent in the first five years. And that's um, you know, 
getting started on the vehicles, of course, but it's also largely that, that hydro and garage facilities uh, effort that needs to get in place, um, you know, in time for the vehicles as they start arriving and, and as you're building up uh, site by site. Uh, so it's a lot of dollars. So that implementation plan allowed um, the city to uh, put forward a plan to council uh, mid-2021, and I'll also talk a bit more about this uh, later, uh, to address high-capacity buses, or to address, sorry, 40-foot buses. Um, they have a higher range than the high-capacity um, uh, double-decker and articulated buses do, just because of the size differences. Um, and, you know, these critics and, and double-deckers tend to operate in different kinds of contexts. You go back in time and OC Transport purchased articulated buses initially in order to put them on the busy corridors, particularly the transitway routes. Uh, so, you know, they operate in different kind of context and uh, is the recommendation of battery electric and garage charge uh, appropriate? So they asked us to do a little bit more assessment of that. And uh, we did by first, um, you know, which are we going to look at? The two vehicles are, are different. We selected articulated buses for a couple of reasons. One, they are the next ones that need to be replaced um, before some of the double deckers, uh, given their age and lifespan and so on. And the second reason was, um, you know, you can buy in the marketplace a, um, a articulated battery electric bus, and um, there are examples out there operating. Um, it's not new if you will it's new but you get what i mean it's not new um the double deckers however uh, well they've been operating a version of them have been operating in in london particularly uh, in the uk for quite some time now um they're not prevalent in the north american marketplace there's only a couple of agencies that are testing them uh in service go transit just recently in the last couple of months brought some in um, and uh, but generally, they're doing the rounds as prototypes and being tested and that kind of thing. Um, so we decided to focus on the articulated ones. We looked at three technologies, battery electric, garage charged. And the implications there are that um, you can't send the bus out for the whole day and complete the whole required service day that you can today with diesel. So they have to go back to the garage at some point and be replaced. Uh, so the implication is um, you need to have more buses available than you would need if you were running this with diesel. So there's a cost there. Um, battery electric on street charging, you can run it like a diesel system, but you have extra time that you have to schedule in because at the end of every trip, you need to, you know, give it a little bit of juice, charge it up so that it can, you know, do the rest of the system. And then the trolley bus, we were asked to look at that again because, um, you know, you would never build a trolley system to do the whole region, all the bus routes everywhere. But perhaps looking at a particular corridor or, or high frequency uh, route might be appropriate. Um, so we, we included that and did a comparative assessment of these three technologies on the base of the future baseline BRT corridor. Um, so that's you know, the median type BRT plan that is in place at the city between Bayshore Terminal, past Queensway Carl, and down the baseline corridor, past baseline station, and then down Heron and up to the Billings Bridge station. Um, we scheduled, as a transit scheduler would, to uh, each of the technologies to figure out the vehicle requirements, the fleet, the schedules, times, everything for all three technologies into a 15 year life cycle analysis of the three approaches with those schedules in place. And learned the following, that uh, the trolley bus scenario is much more expensive to both implement and construct, as well as to operate. In fact, about 40% more expensive over a 15-year life cycle than either of the bus, factory electric bus scenarios. So that meant no more trolley bus. Um, and the other two were quite similar over a 15-year life cycle. The um, additional vehicles you need in the garage charged approach get offset by the costs of the overhead um, garage infrastructure, the overhead on street charging infrastructure. One of those uh, uh, setups cost about a million dollars each um, to put in place. And, um, and then you've got the extra schedule time needed um, as well. And uh, so you need a few more fleet, a, a larger fleet operating during the uh, 
um, during the service day. Uh, so it all kind of balances out in the end. Um, so our recommendations then were no further consideration of the trolleybus technology uh, and to plan for the implementation of garage charged over the on street for the variety of reasons, for the following reasons. The, uh, first of all, you don't have the cost, the maintenance costs, and the logistics challenge of the on street charging infrastructure. And I say logistics challenges. We learned from talking with those that are using them now is they're not particularly reliable little beasts. They, uh, they only make a good connection perhaps two thirds of the time. And the recommendation was to put in one additional one over and above what you would need at each terminal place. So there's those additional costs. Um, range is expected to continue to improve as it, we talked about earlier. And uh, certainly if you're operating the high capacity vehicles in the same approach as you're operating your 40 foot vehicles, it allows for a little more flexibility, um, consistency with how you're doing your, your, your operation, your system in the garage, all the vehicles and, and fleet are doing things the same way. And that's, that's very important in a large organization with so many different vehicles and uh, so many people involved. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Alex to talk about all the things that the city has taken from some of this and what they're heading towards now and the next steps. Thanks, John. Um, I'm actually going to step back a little bit too, back to 2019, where kind of concurrently with the uh, Climate Change Master Plan and the BAES project, we also started an electric bus pilot project. Um, initially, this was for the purchase of two battery electric buses. Uh, at the time, we were looking into whether they would be on route charged or garage charged. But as Sean mentioned, the costs and reliability for the on route charging kind of led us uh, towards the uh, garage charge buses. Um, and then kind of as time went on, that expanded to a four bus pilot project. So with the uh, available funds, we were able to purchase four instead of two. And through an RFP, we ended up uh, with four new flyer Excelsior charge buses. They're 40 foot long range buses with 528 kilowatt hour battery packs. Uh, these were delivered in fall of last year. And sort of these are contrasted with, uh, with a smaller battery pack in the three to 400 kilowatt hour range, which allow for fast charging in a garage, but don't have the same uh, service range or service delivery capacity that these longer range batteries do. And that has to do with the different battery, battery chemistries. Um, so with these larger 528 kilowatt hour batteries only allowing up to 150 kilowatt hour charging. So it takes approximately three and a half to four hours to charge one of these electric buses. Um, so throughout the fall, they were going uh, undergoing testing both from delivery and for preparing to put into service. And right now on your average weekday, we have eight blocks selected and those four blocks or four buses will be put onto four of those eight blocks on any given day. Um, and each block travels a number of routes, anywhere from two to six uh, different routes in some cases on some of the blocks, uh, just due to the interlining we do. And the total distance traveled, uh, this is a figure from last Thursday, and it's surely gone up since then, is 23,961 kilometers on those four buses since delivery in the fall of last year. All right, next slide, Sean. Um, and I just wanted to put this up here as an example of the type of raw test data we're getting from these e-buses, both as they're in service and uh, just through testing. So as you can see here, we have some data showing that as the temperature increases, uh, the efficiency gets slightly better. So uh, on your, your vertical axis, you have your kilowatt hours per kilometer used, and you'll see that as there's increased weight, so we're using a 23 passenger uh, test simulation in some of our testing or the days where there's very heavy snow and you have less traction and less regenerative braking, you get close to that two kilowatt hour per kilometer. Uh, but in the warmer days or with slightly less load and even in service, we're seeing we can get down close to one kilowatt hour per kilometer. And uh, this is just all very important information for us to estimate the range uh, for our own route planning purposes and just to inform future uh, purchases of these electric buses. All right, next slide, Sean. Uh, and going back to 2021, uh, in June last year, um, the council approved the plan to purchase only zero emission buses going forward from now on. 
Uh, and as I mentioned before, we have a plan for the first five years being battery electric buses. And then in 2026, because of the rapidly changing technology, we're gonna look at what are the other options, whether we stick with in garage charging, does on route charging get better or does hydrogen become more feasible? Uh, one of the caveats of this report is it all has to be done within the scope of the city's affordability plan. So a lot of this relies on getting those higher tier level of governments to support the capital funds. Uh, but as I discussed later, we're planning to pay back those amounts with the savings from operating these battery electric buses, which um, with some maintenance, but certainly on the fuel, we will be spending a lot less per service hour in the operation of these buses. Um, so we worked with three different firms. Uh, Sean's firm did the BAES project, and that was very instrumental in coming up with our recommendations. Uh, we also received financial modeling advice from Deloitte to kind of balance the capital versus operating expenses over the lifetime of these buses. And a very important component is also Inbari Energy Solutions um, expertise in the charging infrastructure. Uh, Invari is a subsidiary of Hydro Ottawa and what we've learned from other transit agencies both in Ontario and, and across Canada is working with your local energy utility and figuring out what infrastructure uh, requirements both in your garage and off-site are very important. Um, what we learned is as we get closer to that first five years 450 electric bus conversion uh, we do need to upgrade some of the off-site high voltage uh, power lines coming to the garages. And so Invari was able to figure out when that needs to happen and, and what infrastructure is required. And the last point there is it, it's essential for council to know that all uh, current and future operating costs are covered by the revenue sources. And uh, I'll talk in a little bit about what the uh, federal government is offering um, in order to allow us to do this conversion. So uh, next slide, Sean. So there have been two uh, kind of major recent funding announcements that came up midway through the BES project. So we had to uh, kind of work quickly to get our recommendations out to take advantage of these funds. One is a Canada Infrastructure Bank loan that they offer to municipalities across the Canada that allows them to borrow at a much better interest rate for zero emission buses, whether it's hydrogen or battery electric. Um, and the loan is paid back, as I mentioned, through operating costs over the lifetime of the buses. And this is paired with the uh, Zero Emission Transit Fund, or ZETF, uh, through Infrastructure Canada. And this is actually a grant program to help uh, offset some of those high capital costs that Sean mentioned. Because um, as he said, the electric buses cost between five, 500,000 and 50% more for the high capacity buses than the conventional diesel buses. Uh, next slide, Sean. So this is a uh, just a diagram of how it roughly works. So right now we're working with the Canadian Infrastructure Bank and Infrastructure Canada to prepare these loan and funding agreements that will then allow the City of Ottawa to do a competitive procurement um, to replace our buses according to our fleet plan. So we're not right now looking at changing the schedule or number of buses delivered. And for the first five years, our plan is for a one-to-one -one replacement. So where we are buying, for example, 74 buses in an upcoming year to replace 40-foot uh, diesel buses at end of life, we'll be looking to procure roughly that many 40-foot um, battery electric buses. Um, these funds are also going to help go to pay for the garage charging infrastructure. So um, right now we're looking at a uh, two... Um, pantograph system for every electrical dispenser and each one of those units is quite expensive and we'll be uh, installing those with help from Invari and Hydro Ottawa. All right, next slide. Um, and then this this is just a graphical representation of those percentages and numbers above. This, this provides a rough estimate of what those Infrastructure Canada and Canadian um, CIB loans are going to be. So out of the uh, 1 billion uh, program for the 450 buses, approximately 35 to 50% is going to be that Infrastructure Canada loan. And that depends on a whole bunch of aspects, uh, such as how much of the cost is the infrastructure versus the buses. 
And then the city share is going to be the remainder that isn't covered through the uh, Infrastructure Canada or the CIB loan program. All right, next slide, Sean. Um, and then uh, as Sean mentioned, the battery uh, range is going to be uh, increasing over time, but until then we have identified a few risks and some mitigations to those risks. Uh, one is that the long-term performance is uncertain. So as the technology changes, uh, we're expecting these buses to last as long as our diesel buses, if not longer, which is a typical 15 year cycle at OC Transpo. And because of that, we're not buying all our buses at once. We're sticking to the fleet plan, which will gradually change over the fleet to zero emission between now and 2036. Uh, because our most recent diesel buses were delivered in 2021 and we have a roughly 15 year uh, lifespan. So those will be replaced in 2036, which is when the entire fleet will be electrified. Um, another uh, data operational limitation we have is not knowing how the battery will degrade. Um, you hear all the time about how the beginning of life uh, of electric vehicles always has longer range than the end of life. And so we're learning uh, from other transit agencies who have been operating these buses before we have just how much their batteries are degrading over time. We're also somewhat protected from this because manufacturers do offer now battery uh, warranties that, for example, will protect a battery to maximum of 20% degradation. So that's leaving 80% of its uh, beginning of life range uh, by a certain year. So we're looking uh, to learn lessons from that to put into our procurements uh, for electric buses going forward. And then regarding range right now, the 40 foot buses we're buying have between 280 and 305 ish kilometers. Obviously on good days, it's higher than that um, range. And we do have some service blocks that are currently over 300 kilometers range in a day. So right now we can break those blocks up into shorter blocks, but that does introduce some inefficiencies. So this is one of the reasons we've also selected 450 buses is because we're able to accommodate that into our network without having to do significant route changes. It's, or, or blocking changes, the routes don't really change. But after 2027, when we hit that five years, then we're gonna have to either rely on uh, technology improvements to get us over those 300 kilometer ranges uh, reliably, or uh, ways to um, block the network differently. Uh, next slide, Sean. And then just to summarize at the end, some of the benefits that we outlined in our, our report to council and just some of the reasons why we recommend going with uh, zero emission, particular battery electric buses are there are no pollution, there's no greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the powertrain. There's still some uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the current technology that comes from diesel auxiliary heaters that we use in cold weather. Uh, this helps significantly extend the range because right now uh, when it goes below zero, the uh, battery would have to be used quite heavily to heat the buses. Um, the, the new battery buses, they're gonna be replacing life expired diesel buses. So we're not needing to change the overall fleet. We're gonna retrofit our existing garages to accommodate them. Um, this definitely helps address the climate change master plan's goal of uh, getting to zero emissions. And the reduced operating costs I mentioned above are significant and they're gonna be used to fund the capital costs. And I guess one of the last, last benefits here is quieter buses. And we do hear noise complaints from customers, from residents, and this will definitely help uh, make the streets of Ottawa quieter. And uh, I think that wraps up our presentation. And so we have, looks like about 15 minutes left for questions. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Alex. That was super interesting. I know I have a few questions. Um, let's see if there are any in the chat first. Um, I'll ask the chat questions and then um, we can open the floor too for if people want to uh, to chime in via microphone. Um, so from Nicholas, we have, do you know the chemistry or brand of the batteries the electric buses uh, use? So the short answer would be no, not in detail. <laughs> um, we, um, we certainly talk to vehicle manufacturers as opposed to battery manufacturers. The, the vehicle guys, you know, they build the bus structure and then they integrate all the different systems into it, you know, batteries and 
wiring and other various systems that, that go with it, suspension, you know, as they build the bus. And um, they've, they've uh, given us some information about uh, the fact that, um, you know, there's a different battery chemistry if you want to do fast charging compared with regular slow charging and what have you, or, um, if you want to have good battery life. But uh, in terms of the details, no, sorry. <laughs> I think that was great. Um, Colin asks, uh, you mentioned needing more e-buses than diesel due to uh, range limitations. Uh, did you also look at the additional operator requirements in that costing, I guess? Thanks for the, I'll take this one. Thanks for the question, Colin. Uh, thanks for listening in. Um, so we kind of planned around that a little bit. Um, in, in going with the first five year and 450 bus recommendation, that allows us to assign the e-buses that do have shorter range to existing blocks that fit within the range. So for example, uh, right now about 68%, just over two thirds of our, our runs can accommodate um, the electric bus range. So within the first five years, we're not actually going to need more e-buses than diesel buses. Where that becomes tricky is the uh, beyond five years. So um, that's why in 2026, we're going to have to update this planning work because we'll either need to factor in increased range through technology, or at that point, we're going to have to look at either additional operator requirements or some other way to add service hours into the network uh, to accommodate for the extra deadheading of these buses back to the garage to charge. That's kind of going to be the main time constraint there. Um, so kind of indirectly, we looked at it by identifying where the limits are for those 450 buses. But you're right in mentioning that eventually, if the range doesn't increase, we will need to look at adding uh, additional operators or operator time. Thank you. Um, Andrew asks, uh, great presentation and project. Uh, were emissions associated with manufacturing considered? I guess he's talking about batteries and and all of that stuff. Was it externalized or was it considered implicitly in, in your uh, calculations? In I'm the not initial, aware. Go ahead, yeah, Sean. Say in the initial selection of technologies, um, we took, um, a, I was gonna say a cursory look, I don't know if that's the right term, but we took a, a high level look at, um, at um, you know, tailpipe emissions versus upstream and, and also downstream afterwards um, and impacts of, of that once you're trying to get rid of the bus. Um, so it's all very theoretical at that stage. You know, the primary concern at the city's level is the tailpipe emissions and, and being carbon neutral there, I think it's fair to say, anything else? Yeah, like we looked at the, for the purpose of the study, basically just the curb emissions. And I like this project didn't do the greenhouse gas model that the city used that's in the energy evolution study. And I believe they also just looked at the direct emissions within Ottawa and, and didn't consider the, the manufacturing. Okay, thanks. Um, Andrew also asks, uh, does Hydro Ottawa expect to be able to keep up with electrification demands from all other sources, i.e. building, heating, cooling, auto, elect, uh, electric vehicles in the coming years? Has that kind of been, yeah, I guess, considered throughout this? Um, that's a good question. I know for our, our project and our electrification, they've told us they will be able to accommodate our full fleet electrification over time as the upgrades happen during the next 15 years. Um, I, I'm not sure what discussions they've had with the other large energy users in town. They're certainly, they exist and, and I imagine they would, but I can't speak specifically to that. I guess yeah, that's I do, Andrew. <laughs> I guess that kind of dovetails with one of the questions that I had. Um, when you were considering alternatives, uh, did uh, did time of day in terms of charging or generation of hydrogen, for example, kind of come into it? Because I, I know like there's a lot of excess energy that's kind of grounded uh, throughout the night uh, versus 
um, you know, at peak peak time. So um, was that a consideration? Were there options to kind of get a good deal on some of this energy if you are doing the the bulk of your you know hydrogen generation or battery charging overnight in this case? Um, it it did come up. Um, so throughout the planning process, we looked at a representative schedule of our regular day-to-day -day bus operations and figure out when is both the time required to charge to get the buses back into service, but also what time of day could we do, for example, overnight charging. Um, we're a little bit limited in that there are some requirements for the bus to come back and charge no matter what, but uh, we're able to also schedule that. And so we worked with Invari to come up with a charging schedule uh, as part of the electricity demand and cost calculations. Um, we're working with them now on some estimates for what they call a class A account that takes into account um, the peak charging day. I think it's using the, the peak five days of the year and how to offset that. Um, they're also able to do things like sequential charging. So by having two buses on two pantographs connected to one charger, we're able to have one bus charge and then the other one charge automatically without intervention. So there's uh, certain technology tools we have in order to optimize that charging. Um, right now we're using chargers from, uh, testing chargers from ABB and Siemens that both incorporate um, some kind of algorithms or AI in order to optimize charging for those purposes. Um, so there is a lot of work on the back end going into uh, electricity demand management because that's a huge, uh, huge part of the cost. Thank you, uh, Sean. Do you have anything to add in terms of the uh, Dylan work on that? I just the only thing I'd add is in the high capacity analysis when we were scheduling the three scenarios to figure out the fleet needs to to make them happen along that particular corridor, um, we certainly, you know, didn't want to have buses charging. Uh, during the conventional peak periods, you know, uh, as much as possible overnight, but you still have to have some happening in the middle of the day between the peaks. So. Cool, thank you. Um, Colin asks, uh, how much heavier are the electric buses and uh, are there concerns about pavement damage, for example, in that kind of uh, consideration? Don't think there's concern about pavement damage, Colin, in this case. the um, the the capacity there's there's room for example on, on some of the models of 40 foot buses to put more battery capacity in but then you if you do that you have to reduce the passenger capacity on the bus <laughs> so it's a balance they're they're heading towards you know the bus is at the, the maximum weight when it's got sort of a the maximum passenger volume on the vehicle itself um, and uh, so you know from that sense it doesn't meet the it doesn't break any of the the sort of pavement design rules, uh, but uh, the implications are more batteries, less people, etc. Is there is there maybe a rough ratio you could kind of maybe comment on that you're aware of, like if it's like you know one and a half something like that times heavier at peak load, for example? Uh, I'm not sure right off the top of my head. I'd have to check that in the records. <laughs> Sure. No, definitely. I think that would probably maybe have implications in terms of uh, collision safety too. Um, so Andrew asks, do manufacturers expect that costs of electric buses and associated technology will uh, come down as demand increases? I asked that question, Andrew, to, uh, to the two main manufacturers uh, that have the sort of the full fleet variations. And uh, both of them gave me the same answer. Um, prices of the technology that you buy today, if you were to buy that same technology in a year or two or three or four, would definitely go down. But the technology is expected to continue to improve. So that means it's going to maintain the price level in order to get the, the, the newer technology, uh, the higher range, uh, the better batteries, what have you. So for the sake of the effort uh, in this study, it was assumed that that price level of those vehicles would be consistent across the time. Great, thanks. Um, Ashley asks, uh, what about emissions related to building operations? My understanding uh, based on publicly available data is that existing buildings are energy hogs. 
are they going to be retrofitted during the uh, battery electric bus infrastructure upgrades? So, I, I, yes and no. Um, our plan for upgrading the buildings is more related to uh, structural elements. Um, there's a lot of retrofitting that needs to happen to the buildings to meet the, particularly the weight load of adding the electric charging infrastructure to the roofs because in, in our garage plan, we are going with fully uh, pantograph chargers because that eliminates the space requirement for uh, pedestal chargers kind of in between the lanes of parked buses. Um, I think I I'm just gonna venture out and say part of the reason a lot of the buildings are inefficient is, is likely due to age. So as they get updated, they'll be built to current building codes, which will indirectly do that. But in terms of our OC transport garages right now, our focus is on retrofitting them to accommodate the charging infrastructure and the associated uh, electrical rooms and substations, for example. And the other challenge with the garage is beyond the age that Alex mentioned is that they all have dozens of giant double garage doors that are up and down all the time, uh, making it hard to, uh, to maintain your internal environment, in, in particular the garage component areas. So. That makes sense. Um, so just, just a general note for everybody, uh, we are reaching one o'clock. Um, uh, the presenters have agreed to stay a few extra minutes to kind of wrap up any of the, the questions, but um, probably maybe going to go five, ten minutes over if people are interested. Uh, so I'll just keep running, plowing through these. Um, Wayne asks, is there consideration on how charging facilities can be utilized during the daytime for large commercial EVs or school buses and that kind of thing while the city buses are deployed on their routes? I'll take a step at that, Alex. The um, the fleet gets fully deployed during the peak periods, sort of the AM rush hour, the PM rush hour, and uh, falls down to perhaps 50 or 60 percent of the full fleet during the middle of the weekday. Um, that would be a time when the charging is going on um, as well as as the overnight times. So I don't know that there'd be that much. Um, capacity for such a thing. And then um, the, uh, I've yet to see a school bus, electric school bus marketed with the pantograph charging approach uh, happening. I'm not as familiar with some of the other kind of big, uh, um, you know, city vehicles that are out there and their electric capabilities. I know some similar work we've done in Regina, they are, they are looking at other solutions beyond battery electric for some of the big snow plows and the like. So. I'm just gonna to add to like a potential future uh, project for this could be related to opportunity or on route charging. So right now we don't really have any non OC transport, non, non uh, city vehicles that do maintenance or charging or anything in our garages. But if the city does commit to more kind of public charging or charging at stations where we do have uh, contracts with outside um, charter buses or other bus agencies that do enter our stations, um, that could be something we look at kind of post five years down the road, where if we do consider opportunity charging in the future, that might be a, a chance, I'm going to say opportunity to uh, collaborate with other large vehicle and bus providers. Um, I hope uh, I'm not breaking up here, getting a little bit of technical uh, issues on my end, but uh, let me know. Um, Ashley also says, surprising that uh, en route fast charging kind of was discounted. Um, doesn't this increase risk? Many other public transit agencies that are electrifying their fleet use a combination of on, on route and, and depot charging. And I guess that kind of gets to the point of like failure modes and uh, and you know decentralization of of the facilities such that there's no individual failure point. Is that was that considered as part of the uh, the analysis? Some of the challenges we learned about, as I mentioned in the presentation, that um, these facilities weren't that reliable um, as well. So, you know, when we were looking at the high capacity analysis, we, for example, in order to accommodate the schedule of the vehicles and the frequency of service during times, there were needed to be, you know, two charging units at Bayshore and two at Billings Bridge at the end of each at the line, basically. And then the recommendation was because they don't work, Sometimes you need to put 
put an extra one in. So we put three in in each place. Um, that's fine. Um, the, uh, you had the reliability issues. Um, the other issue we learned about was uh, the battery chemistry. Um, if you want to buy a bus that has the longest range possible, you know, the 500 and whatever it was uh, number that uh, Alex mentioned it, it bought for the pilot project test buses, that's the, the, the highest range available, highest battery capacity available. Um, the battery chemistry on that long range isn't amenable to fast charging um, out at the on-street chargers um, without doing serious damage to the battery and really shortening the life. Um, so you have to buy a different kind of bus and um, with, a, with a lower capacity with a different battery chemistry that um, it does its thing. You're not going to buy a long range bus with that additional expensive battery chemistry. So, um, you know, so it was a bit of a toss up in that sense. And um, there's practical reasons to, you know, if, if, if we can, every transit agency would love to simply replace their diesel buses one for one with a battery electric bus and go to do its thing. Um, so that's the goal initially, and uh, the hope and expectation is that the um, the range will and, and, and other factors with the bus will improve enough as in the, the coming few years and several years come by that you'll be able to do that. And you won't need to manage and deal with all of those on recharging uh, types of capabilities. I can agree with Ashton. It would be great someday to be able to just put in a one for one replacement. Uh any bus type, whether it's 40 foot, double deckers, just uh, switch them out one for one. We're not there yet, but uh, we're hoping to. Cool. And last question, uh, when you start uh, from Peter, when you first start to roll these out, do you, uh, would, you preference, would your preference be to uh, use them on routes with frequent start, stops and starts to take advantage of regen braking and avoid emissions? Uh, higher diesel buses start to move away from stops, that kind of thing? So that is definitely something we're looking at. Um, right now, because we only have four buses, we're assigning them to basically as much variability in the route selection as we can to get as many data points as we can for things like elevation for frequency of stops. Um, initially, all we had to go off of was the data supplied by the manufacturer on the buses and we're testing those on basically as many of those scenarios you mentioned as possible um, to get that data. Eventually we're going to be moving to more modern versions of our scheduling software. Right now we use Hastis. There are newer versions of it available as well as other competing products available that kind of take into account these operating variables for scheduling electric buses. Uh, because again, we're doing it manually, kind of by hand, selecting these routes and runs currently. But as you go into 100 buses and then 400 buses, it becomes kind of exponentially harder to assign them. And, and we will be using kind of automated software in order to input the data we've learned from our uh, pilot test project to kind of optimize the range on the routes we select. I'm sure that would be a super interesting topic for a presentation all on its own. <laughs> Yeah, I, I thrown in some slides uh, at the end here, and Sean was like, that's a whole rabbit hole we can go into, so we'll save that for another time. <laughs> awesome. Well, maybe we will go down that uh, one day. So thank you. Uh, Andrew finally says, thank you, Alex and Sean, for a very interesting presentation. I would have to agree. Thank you so much for uh, donating your time uh, and, and effort and, uh, and giving us this wonderful presentation about a very uh, exciting project. So thank you. Thank you, John. And thanks, everybody, for the interest and attendance. It's great to uh, share you. this work we've been doing. All right. I guess that's it. Thank you, everybody. Take care, and we'll see you, uh, see you soon.